Thank you, Paul Gordon, and good day to you all. May I say what a delight it is to be here among you. Thank you so much for the welcome. I hold Paul Gordon and his vision in the deepest of respect and reverence, so it is an honor for me to be here working alongside him and to be in your company. One of the most cherished images in the Celtic world, from which I draw so heavily in my life and in my teachings, is the image or memory of John the Beloved. It is said that John the Beloved leaned against Jesus at the Last Supper, and he became in Celtic legend a symbol of the practice of listening deep within ourselves deep within one another, deep within the body of the earth, to the beats of the sacred presence. I invite us back into this posture. It is, I believe, the essential posture of true relationship and interrelationship, attentive to the presence, to the sound, to the beat of the sacred at the heart of one another and all things. So I will again and again be inviting us back into this posture as essential for a true path forward. So it's wonderful to be with you in Wyoming, and very kind of you to lay on some weather that makes me feel so much at home. <laughs> I don't know what I would have done with the morning of sunshine. <laughs> So, John the Beloved begins the prologue to his gospel by saying, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then he goes on to say, And all things have come into being through the Word. Which is to say that everything is essentially an expression of the divine. Do you know that that is what you are, each one of you, and everything that has being? Each one of you is a unique and unrepeatable expression of the one. That we are born not by accident, but by divine destiny. There are things for you to say, to think, to see, to embody, to act, that no one else can do. That's not to inflate ourselves. It is, to me, the way of true humility, knowing that what is deepest in us is this unique and unrepeatable expression of the one. In Scotland, I was influenced by a beautiful Jesuit priest named Jerry Hughes. Some of you may have come across his writings. He wrote a book called the God of Surprises. But if Jerry had been here and had an opportunity to introduce himself, he would very typically say, hello, I'm Jerry, a unique manifestation of the divine. <laughs> that is how we are being invited to see one another, to approach one another, to approach every life form. It is also very challenging how we are being invited to view our own depths, made of God, unique expressions of the One. So loved is this prologue to John's Gospel that very early on we find paraphrases of the opening words of John's Gospel. As early as the second century, we hear the paraphrase in the beginning was the sound, and the sound was with God, and the sound was God, and everything has been sounded into being. Everything is essentially a vibration of the sacred presence. One of the reasons why I so love this paraphrase is because it takes us immediately to the East. In the beginning was Om, that first word that is celebrated in the East that word, that utterance from which everything has come into being. 
It's a profoundly exciting time to be followers of Christ's wisdom. And one of the things that we are hearing, not only from within the wisdom of our Christian household, but in every great religious tradition, every great spiritual path, is a sense that everything is essentially an expression or a sounding of the one. And at the same time, new science is enabling us to begin to comprehend that the sound of the beginning is everywhere. It continues to vibrate deep within everything that has being. And science has identified the sound of the beginning as a B-flat, way down. Now, not to be too boastful about this matter, but the Scottish bagpipes are tuned. <laughs> I believe it should really be on the platform of why we should be an independent nation. <laughs> this little nation could remind the world about the sound of the beginning. It is deep in all things. But more importantly and more excitingly, we are being invited to be attentive to the sound of the divine within ourselves and within all that has life. To be attentive to, to serve, to be part of liberating that true sounding of God from our own depths and from all things, from within all things. A teacher of mine in Edinburgh, when I was studying theology about 150 years ago, <laughs> was named Mill O'Donoghue, a priest, uh, really an Irish leprechaun from Terry Kerry, who deeply influenced John O'Donoghue and me and many others who continue to work in this field. But Mill O'Donoghue also loved the opening words of John's Gospel, and he had his own paraphrase. He used to like to say, in the beginning was the gift, and the gift was with God, and the gift was God, and everything has come into being through gift, that is through grace. Everything is grace. This moment, the rising of the sun, the beating of our hearts, the births of our children, new life forms springing from the earth. But Noel always wanted to go on to say, yes, in the beginning was the gift, but it is a gift that is shrouded also in pain. One of the important notes that I would like to strike at the very beginning as we draw from this rich spiritual tradition of wisdom is that this is not a romanticism. This is not a tradition that forgets the way in which so much life is shrouded in pain. So I will be inviting us these days to look for both the glory and to be attentive also to the suffering. Hildegard of Bayen in the 12th century said so beautifully. She said we are to fly with two wings of awareness, as she put it. One is the wing of awareness of life's beauty and life's glory. The other, she said, is to fly with an awareness also of life's suffering and pain. She said if we try to fly with only one wing of awareness, we will be like an eagle trying to fly with only one wing. We will not ascend a true height of vision for one another and for our world. So we'll be inviting us to be attentive both to the unspeakable beauty and glory of the gift of life and to be constantly aware of the suffering and the brokenness that we know within ourselves, within our own families and nation, within the earth community. The first teacher of historical reference 
in the Celtic stream, Celtic Christian stream of wisdom, is Irenaeus of Lyon in the second century. He appears in second century Gaul. I R E N A E U S, Irenaeus. We sometimes think of the Celtic world very limitedly in terms of Ireland, Scotland, Wales, Cornwall. But that's just the fringe, that's just the edge of a world of interrelated uh, Celtic art, language, culture that spanned the whole of Middle Europe, ranging from as far east as Turkey right through to the Atlantic coastline of Spain, taking in places like Galatia, Galicia, Gaul, all these place names that just mean the land of the Gales, the land of the Celts. Today, I'd like to be drawing especially from the French stream that begins in someone like Irenaeus of Lyon. Irenaeus had been a student of Polycarp, and Polycarp had been the student of John, the beloved, this one who so, is so cherished in Celtic legend as the one who leaned against Jesus, the one who symbolizes the practice of listening to the beat of the sacred in all things. In Irenaeus, we hear all of John's favorite themes. In the beginning was the word and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and everything has come into being through the Word. Everything is essentially an utterance or expression of the One. Irenaeus, in the second century, is concerned about the development of a way of thinking in Mediterranean Christianity as early as the second century. It is a way of seeing that is later formalized in the doctrine of the church when Christianity gets into bed with empire in the fourth century. One of the first things that is expected of it is a doctrine that came to be known as creation ex nihilo, creation out of nothing, in which it is said that a transcendent being, God, fashioned the universe out of nothing. Irenaeus says, the universe, our bodies, the body of earth, these have not been fashioned by God out of nothing. He uses a word that still shocks our dualistic Western ears. And he says, creation has not been fashioned out of nothing. It's come out of the very substance of God. In other words, this stuff, the stuff of the human body, is sacred. How we handle one another in relationship, how we care for the most physical needs of those who are hungry and homeless and seeking shelter and sanctuary in our nation, these are sacred matters. The body of earth is sacred. How we handle it with reverence with equity and with justice, is at the very heart of our spiritual calling. This, of course, is not what empire wanted to hear. So one of the first actions of the imperial church was to pronounce the doctrine of creation ex nihilo, which was an attempt in some ways to neutralize matter, to say, well, it was fashioned out of nothing so we can do whatever we wish to matter. And this has been the way of empire and how it has co-opted religion to sanction how it approaches matter. I speak not just of the Roman Empire in the fourth century. I speak of the way the British Empire has behaved. I speak also of the way the American Empire has behaved. Any nation that sets itself up over the rest of humanity and is prepared to exploit the Earth's resources limitedly for its own well-being in the, in the delusion that thinking we could be well simply by looking after ourselves and not, by the well, not for the well-being of all nations, of all people, of all life forms. Now, if everything is essentially sacred, 
as someone like Irenaeus is teaching as early as the second century, then what is the role of Christ? In so much of our Western Christology, we've been given the, the impression that Christ comes almost to airlift us into well-being, into salvation, which represents a type of desertion or discarding of earth and of the physical. Irenaeus says, Christ is the recapitulation of the word, of the utterance, of the sounding that is deep in all things. Now, what is it we do when we recapitulate something? We say again what has been forgotten or what needs to be clarified or brought back up into consciousness. So he sees Christ not as a new word not as a word that is opposed to what is deepest in all things, but rather as a new sounding of the word that is at the very heart of everything that has life. And Irenaeus sees our Christhood that is living into the true expression of the divine and the human intermingling that is at the core of our being. He sees our Christhood as coming into expression when we resound the word of the divine, the sounding, the expression of the divine, that is the very source of all life. He sees our Christhood as being embodied when we resound or resound with the deepest vibration of the holy in all things. There is a great yearning today for a spirituality of intimacy with earth as opposed to a spirituality of alienation from Earth, or from what the Celts again and again over the centuries have called the great cathedral of Earth, sea, and sky. Looking for, listening for, being in relationship with the vibration of the sacred that is deep in all things. <clears throat> After my time on the island of Iona, which is like our cherished little holy island in Scotland. I would be interested to see a show of hands of those of you who have been to the island of Iona. Great. Well, the rest of you need to come. <laughs> and uh, not all at once, it's a small island. After my four years at the Abbey on Iona, I went to be part of the uh, ecclesiastical team, priestly team at St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh, which is our little Scottish national cathedral. Very early in my time there, I had a dream in which I was standing in the pulpit of St. Giles Cathedral, which sort of hugs one of the 1,000-year-old pillars at the heart of the cathedral, one of my favorite holy places in the world. But in the dream, when I was standing in the pulpit, I was aware that there was no roof to the cathedral. It just opened out into the cosmos. But below me in the dream, below the pulpit, there was an artificial ceiling under which the congregation sat. I was aware in the dream that they could hear me, but I couldn't see them. So in the dream, I needed to make a decision. Should I stay up in the pulpit in this open place that opened out into the interrelationship of all things? Or should I descend and stand under the artificial ceiling that represented a sort of boundary or closure between the gathering and all things? In the dream, I realized that I must continue to speak from the place that opened out into the interrelationship of all things, rather than to move into that place of artificial separation from the cosmos and Earth. Now, this was a particular dream. It came to me at a particular moment in my particular journey. But it is a dream also that I believe belongs to us and it belongs to this moment because what we are being invited to ask is where will we speak from? Will we speak from this place 
of the sacred interrelationship of all things? Or will we continue to allow aspects of our tradition to give the impression that Christ is an embodiment of a word that is somehow opposed to what is deepest in all things? Or that Christ is embodying a vision that somehow leads to a desertion of earth or a discarding of the physical made of God? At best, our sanctuaries, these places where we gather and love to pray and experience community. At best, these spaces are to be like side chapels onto the great cathedral of earth, sea, and sky. And what we do in these side chapels, the rituals that we are part of, the language and symbolism that we use, the teachings that we offer, must keep pointing back to the living sanctuary of the divine in all things. One of the great, perhaps greatest of teachers in this ancient stream of wisdom in the Celtic Christian world that I draw from in my teachings and in especially in this most recent book, Sacred Earth, Sacred Soul, is the ninth century teacher, John Scotus Eriugena. E-R-I-U-G-E-N-A, a difficult name to get a hold of, but if you translate it, it becomes so much simpler to access because it just means John the Irishman from Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> so he was from Ireland, but he spent most of his life in the Gallic territory of ancient France, Gaul. Eriugena says that God is forever speaking through two books. One, he says, is the little book, physically little, the book of scripture. The other, he says, is the big book, the sacred text of earth, the text of the expanding, unfolding universe. And he says we are to listen to both books in stereo, as it were, allowing ourselves to access the wisdom of these two sacred texts. If we listen only to the little book, he says, we may miss the vastness of the utterance, living, unfolding, still giving rise to new forms in the universe. But if we listen only to the big book and neglect the little book, he says, we may miss the intimacy of the voice, because the little book of scripture so cherishes relationship and contains this powerful prophetic voice of relationship with the most powerless, relationship with those who are suffering, calling us again and again back into relationship with them as part of what wholeness is. <clears throat> Eugenia says that everything is essentially a theophany. Everything is essentially as a showing or a revealing or manifesting of the divine. Eugenia can be wonderfully playful in his scholarly wisdom. One of the words that he loves to play with is the Greek word for God in transliteration T-H-E-O-S, theos the word for God. And he says it's derived from the Greek verb, theo, which means to flow or to run. God is the one who flows deep in all things, like the subterranean flow deep within everything that has being. And he says if somehow this flow of the divine deep within all things were to be dammed up, then everything would cease to exist. So the flow of the divine is not to be looked for only in certain places, in certain traditions, certain people at certain times. It is to be looked for, accessed at the heart of all things, at the heart of every moment. One of the other teachers that I draw from in the new book is the modern Scottish poet, Kenneth White. He is faithful like Gary Eugenia. And he plays on Eugenia's playfulness and says, 
God is not, God is not only the flow deep of light deep within all things, God is the glow flow deep within all things. And I'd like to play further on Kenneth White's playfulness and say God is not only the flow, God is not only the glow flow of light within all things, but we need to let go to the glow flow. <laughs> That's all we need to do. We don't need to create this flow we can't. We don't need to invoke it as if it's form. We need to let go. We need to find ways of knowing that this is the very flow of our being that we are being invited back into. To be attentive to serving that flow and setting it free in one another and all things. So today we are living through this great yearning <clears throat> to be in true relationship with the flow of the divine <coughs> at the heart of earth and at the heart of all things, of spirit and matter interwoven. Many years ago, during an Iona pilgrimage week, I shared an evening meal with a woman who I think was in her early 70s. And over the course of the meal, she shared with me some of her spiritual journey. And in particular, she wanted to share with me the story of something that had happened 50 plus years earlier, when she was an adolescent girl, around 15. She was in church in Florida on a Sunday morning, as her family's practice and custom was. Halfway through the morning service, a dog wandered into the sanctuary sauntered up the central line, got up to the altar, began to sniff around the altar. And it did not do what you think I'm going to say. <laughs> it left the sanctuary. And that girl got up and what she said to me was, it didn't like what it smelled. It didn't smell right. It didn't smell natural. And that girl got up and followed the dog out of the sanctuary, and she had never been back. Now, this woman's story, of course, is eccentric in some of its details. But at another level, this woman's story is the story of hundreds of thousands, I would say probably millions, of our brothers and sisters who began their life gathered around the altar within the four walls of our Christian household, and they are no longer there. Because something doesn't smell right. It doesn't smell natural. There is an insufficient link between the very core of our rituals and celebrations and the great living cathedral of earth, sea, and sky that we are being invited to move back into relationship with if there is to be a sustainable future for our grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I'd like to spend a bit of time on a modern prophet in the French dream again, who anticipated the longing, the yearning that is in people like this woman who spoke about leaving the church 55 years ago. She told her story, not with apology, but with a deep sadness. Because for most of her life, she has lived without the strength and grace of community with whom to pray, with whom to grieve at times of loss, to celebrate at times of new birth, with whom to work for change and transformation. And in this also, she's not alone. Because so many of those hundreds of thousands, if not millions of our brothers and sisters, who have sensed something doesn't smell right, something doesn't smell natural, they too are longing for a new vision and a new experience of community. They too are longing to find ways of standing in a circle again 
around the altar at the heart of our Christian household, to be strengthened in their vision and their commitment to moving back into true relationship with earth and one another. So a prophet in the, in the French Celtic stream who anticipated this growing diaspora that exists today is the French priest, scientist, Jesuit mystic, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, whom I give a chapter to in the new book. His dates are 1881 to 1955. In many ways, he was a resurrection of the ancient Gallic vision of someone like Irenaeus, who says that everything is made or comes out of the very substance of the divine. Teilhard's way of putting it is to say at the heart of matter is the heart of God. The deeper we move in anything that has being, the closer we come to the beat of the sacred, to the heartbeat from which we have all emerged. So just as Irenaeus says that we and all things have come out of the substance of the divine, so Teilhard refuses the dualism that has so dominated so much of our Western thought and religion, the dualism of spirit on the one hand and matter on the other. Teilhard speaks of this stuff the stuff of the human body and the body of earth as spirit matter, spirit hyphen matter. He came to see that the whole universe is like a burning wood. Reference to that earliest vital story of revelation in Hebrew scripture in which Moses encounters a bush that is on fire without being consumed, on fire with the divine. As my rabbi brother from New Mexico likes to say, the important thing about that story is not that the bush was burning, but that Moses noticed. Because every bush is on fire. Every living thing is on fire with the shining of the divine. Teilhard says, the great mystery of Christianity is not exactly the appearance of God in the universe, it is the transparency of God in the universe. In every human countenance, in the eyes of every living creature, in the shining of every life form, we are being invited to glimpse the very light of the divine. Teilhard, like most of the great Celtic teachers, who appear in this stream of wisdom over the centuries, Teilhard, like most of those before him, was accused of pantheism. Almost as soon as one begins to speak about the sacredness of all life, a misunderstanding that often comes, and this one that comes in, in response to my teaching, is to say that when you're teaching pantheism, Let's make an important distinction between pantheism, this philosophical term that is used to refer to the belief that everything is God, pan, all things, theism, God. The philosophical term, if we're looking for one, to describe Teilhard and the stream of wisdom is not pantheism, but is pan and theism. Simply place an en after pan and you get what these great teachers have seen since the second century. They prefer not to speak in philosophical terms like panentheism. They prefer much more readily to speak in poetic language, like the soul within our soul, the light within all light, the sun behind the sun, this way of speaking to the divine flow or presence that is the very essence of all being. And this, I believe, is the most critical issue facing our Christian household today. Will we allow our love of the light that is in Christ to lead us to look for that light, to serve it, to adore it, to be part of liberating it deep from within every life form and within every human being? Or will we continue to allow our tradition to give the impression that the light 
of, of Christ that we love is somehow essentially foreign to that. It's somehow essentially over against what is deepest in all things, rather than a manifestation, a disclosure of what is deepest within us and everything that has life. Not surprisingly, Teilhard, like so many of the teachers who came before him in the Celtic stream, became an inconvenience to power. Power so often does not want to hear that all life, that every life form is sacred. So Teilhard, the, the Vatican decided in its wisdom in 1926 to send Teilhard to China to get him out of the way. He was a scientist, a paleontologist, so they sent him to China to be part of the paleontological dig. That, they thought, would deal with Teo. Little did they know what the East would do to Teo. Because in China, Teo now begins to speak not only of the sacredness of all things, he begins to speak about the fragrance of the feminine that is deep within all things. This aspect of the divine that is in all of us as men and women, this aspect of the divine that invites into relationship, that attracts oneness and union. Care is giving voice to another aspect of what we hear again in new science. And that is, at one level, every atom in the universe is longing to remain in relationship with every other atom. Otherwise, the whole thing would spin off into unrelatedness. Scientists don't claim to understand this attraction. They describe it. Brian Swim, the new cosmologist, calls it the urge to merge. <laughs> The Earth has been revolving around the Sun for over 4.5 billion years. This could be described as a long-term stable relationship. <laughs> it is a love affair. And we are born of this love affair. And we are born for love. We are born to serve this interrelationship of all things in which we will find our well-being and the true well-being for our nation and the true well-being of our wisdom tradition of Christianity. Teilhard speaks about the amorization of the universe, the bringing all things back into relationship through the power and energy of love. He says after humanity has learned how to harness all of the greatest energies of earth, sea, and sky. We will finally learn how to harness our greatest energy, love. And on that day, he says, humanity will have discovered fire for the second time. Terre returned to Europe at the end of World War II. He almost immediately again becomes an inconvenience to ecclesiastical power. In part because they had heard the sorts of things he was saying and teaching in China. Among which was Teir saying, we need to save Christ from the hands of the clergy so that the world may be saved. <laughs> Let's spend a bit of time with that. Yeah, it's funny we laugh. Let's be clear, this is not cheap humor from Teilhard. Who was he? He was a priest. He had been silenced by his own tradition. Not allowed to teach or preach. Not allowed to publish any of his writings. He so believed in priesthood that he chose to stay in that location. But his comment is reflecting, reflective of the way in which so much of our inherited priesthood or teaching role gets trapped into seeing Christ as somehow 
limited the hours, or looking to the light of Christ as somehow essentially opposed to what is deepest in all things, rather than revealing and setting free the light that is deep in all things. So the Vatican decided that it needed to send Teilhard into a second exile. This time they sent him to that other remote outpost of humanity, the United States of America. <laughs> he was sent to New York to be part of the Jesuit community in New York, although often he, had to be, he was away on paleontological digs in Africa and elsewhere. One of the beautiful things about Teilhard in my eyes, is that he was a faithful son of the Christian household. Yes, he had been silenced, but he continued to believe that there was treasure in our Christian household for Earth at this moment in time. He had been silenced. He had not been allowed to write or to publish. But thank God, in the early 1950s, he decided on an act of disobedience. He signed over all of his writings, none of which had been allowed to be published, to his personal assistant, Mademoiselle Mortier in Paris, with the instructions that when he died, she was to publish everything he had written. So on his death, his writings would not belong to the church. They would belong to Mademoiselle Mortier. Terra died on Easter Day, 1955, in New York City, alone and relatively unknown. There were 10 people at his funeral. One person accompanied his body to the grave up the Hudson River. Recently, and I, I tell something of this story in a new book, and not long ago I met a Jesuit in his 90s who said to me, you're right to say that there were only 10 people at his funeral, and you're right to say there was only one person who accompanied his body to burial. But he said, I was there, up the hill, at this Jesuit novitiate, up the Hudson River. He said, I was there with about 50 other novices. We were told that a great man was going to be buried that day. We didn't even know his name. But we were told, don't get close. This is a dangerous thing. And it would not help your future to be known to have been present at Teilhard's burial. But I was there. And he's so grateful to have been there. After Teilhard's death, Mademoiselle Mortier began to release his writings, one at a time, in the mid and late 1950s. I still meet priests and sisters who were studying and training in the 1950s, who have wonderful stories of reading Teilhard in bed at night, un under the covers with their flashlight, <laughs> strapping his books under the mattress during the day, forbidden writings. This is exactly what theology needs to be. It needs to be so.